So this is the first Rebel Wisdom Q&A. Uh, we announced it earlier in the week and asked you guys to put your questions underneath the video and then to vote up the questions that you wanted answered. Um, so what we've discovered is that our audience is far smarter than us and they've asked us questions that we maybe won't be able to answer, but we'll do what we can. So we're basically going to time this and it'll be an hour and we'll answer, definitely answer the first 12 questions and then we'll start going down below that and work out, depending on how much time we've got, that will decide how many questions we manage to answer. So first, and um, so the, the, the 12 top questions, we're not necessarily going to answer them the order that they were, that they, they were ranked, but we're going to answer all, all 12 of them. Um, and starting with the ones that, that we know that we can answer and moving on to the ones that we're really struggling with. Uh, you can decide for yourselves when that moment comes. <clears throat> so, Ali, yes. why do you use the black sun as a logo? What does it mean to you? Because it looks cool. So yeah, the first thing to say, it's not, yeah. black, it's not a black sun or not, it's not, not deliberately yeah, a black yeah. sun. It's yeah. the eye and the triangle. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Um, and for me, the eye represents the, I guess, the transformative power of um, true knowledge, inner knowledge, truth in general. Um, and yeah, so combined, it, it has that sense for me. I don't know, what, what are your feelings on our logo? Um, I, so from the beginning, when we were trying to put the logo together, um, the idea was, I was listening to a lot of Jordan Peterson stuff at the time, and the idea of the, it was the eye and the pyramid. The pyramid or the, the triangle being truth, logos, the dominance hierarchy, mm. all that sort of stuff. And the eye meaning awareness. Yeah. And the eye, there's actually a little clip that I might dig out and see if we can play where I showed the logo to Jordan Peterson during my first interview and he was like, yeah, that's perfect, you've mm. got it. Because it's the eye, it's the awareness, or it's, it's the eye and the sun in the pyramid that you worship, not the pyramid itself. Yeah. It's the regenerating factor that the, the awareness is consciousness, effectively. It's mm -hmm. the consciousness that is, that is then able to update the structure that we should yeah. be worshiping, not the, the structure itself. I don't know if you saw the um, logo that we put together for Rebel Wisdom and recognized the eye and the, yep. and the triangle. Yep, perfect. We were looking for an abstract kind of way that didn't look too Illuminati. Mm -hmm, it was right. a little bit Illuminati, but not quite, right. quite so much. Yeah, well, that's the thing, is that it's the, it's the sun in the pyramid that you worship, not the pyramid. Mm. Right. Because the sun is the thing that, in both senses, that stops it from being the patriarchy. So that's the thing that you can have a relationship with. That it sort of transcends the dominance hierarchy mm -hmm. itself. It, yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's, it's it, like in, in The Lion King, that there's that little bird, Zazu. Well, he flies above everything and sees everything. And that's the eye. That's the Egyptian eye. It's outside the structure. It's the thing that moves up and down the structure and it, it repairs it. That's what consciousness does in your body. It's, it moves up and down levels of, of reality, let's say. And, mm -hmm and alters them. So, and it's, so it's outside the structure, and it's also the thing that gives rise to the structure, but the structure also gives rise to it. That's why there's Trinitarian ideas in Christianity. You know, there's the Father and the Son, and they're mutually causal. Think, well, how can that be? Well, the Son gives birth to the Father, obviously, because boys turn into men, but the Father also gives birth to the Son, and so that's part of the reason that those Trinitarian ideas exist. Yeah, when we were putting the, the logo together, the only kind of brief that we were kind of clear on is it can't look too Illuminati, because obviously you're starting, <laughs> if you're starting to do pyramids and eyes, then you're, you're getting yeah. into kind of the dollar bill territory, and you're like, okay, it can't be Illuminati. And then, and then we actually got it done, and it was like, yeah, that looks perfect, it's great. Yeah. And one of the first comments was, <laughs> why, why is your logo so Illuminati? Yeah. Um, but my favourite comment ever on one of our films is, what was it? It's a, your logo is Illuminati yeah. as fuck, but you seem legit. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is about as good as it gets. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I really love that idea. And just think, remembering something that was actually in Paul van der Klee's sermon that I don't think we've put out, this particular bit of it, that really stuck with me. The whole idea of 
being able to step out of the structure or the hierarchy or whatever it is and regenerate it and have a different perspective on it is really it's a really deep idea you know he talked about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples of his disciples and that being a an action that kind of took him or kind of inverted everything on his head mm -hmm. and took him out of the dominance hierarchy game altogether really interesting and there's the that the top becomes the bottom and that's a kind of regeneration of the structure. Exactly, yeah. And then there's, the, there's this very famous alchemical image called the, I really hope I pronounce it right, but we can, we can probably put it up on screen, the Telemirion, Telemirion, I think, mm -hmm. with, it's, a lot of people will be aware of it, it's the kind of the initiate climbing through one sphere into the heavens. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. They're kind of on there, yeah, we can put it up though. But I love that kind of alchemical idea of knowledge in general can give us a completely new perspective on reality. And for me, the logo holds some of that um, kind of symbolism in it as well. Cool. Mm. So that's the story of the logo. Um, so question two, do you want to ask question two? Yeah, so question two is from, uh, sorry, sorry, question one, by the way, was from the Dashing Rogue. Question two is from, and I'm going to try and pronounce this correctly, apologies if it's wrong, Landbjort. Um, so what do you two see as the telos or end of all this Peterson slash uh, intellectual dark web stuff? What is the goal to ultimately justify and direct this collective intellectual endeavor? Hmm. It's a great question. It's a great question because mm. I think a lot of people involved in this conversation probably have different ideas about what yeah. the end goal is. Mm. Um, I think Peterson, I mean, the, the end, it's like at the moment the IDW's end goal, or the, the, the goal right now for the IDW is to carve out a space to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, where it goes from there, I think different members of the IDW have different concepts of where it goes from there. Mm. Um, and I think that there is a hope, yeah, they, they do hope that um, it can that having that conversation can begin to find the solutions that will, um, what, what would you say, kind of change society or deal with deal with the yeah. existential threats that we're dealing with. I mean, they've got very big ideas. Definitely, I, yeah, and especially I, the, especially I'm thinking of the Weinsteins yeah. in particular, yeah. Eric Weinstein and Brett Weinstein. They yeah. they seem to be holding one of the the most far sighted pieces in the IDW. Yeah. Um, I think Peterson has a slightly different focus. He's much more focused on the individual and the, um, the transformative power of coming into your true alignment. Yeah. But then as a priority and then that itself becomes the, the, he sees that as the main seat of transformation rather than the structural and the, um, yeah. and I, I'm still not entirely clear on his kind of, the relationship between that and the, and the wider structures of society. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure either on that point. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think one aspect of it is definitely that the kind of conversation that is happening now in the IDW gets integrated into the wider, I guess, into lots of different institutions that are, you know, which is something arguably that needs to happen for us to be able to move forward effectively. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, that's what I hope. What In a sense, maybe it's happening already or the beginnings of it are. Personally, I mean, in, in terms of the question of um, where's the end of it, I don't know. I have mm -hmm. no idea. Where I would like it to go is to quite, um, is to open the space for a more uh, integral way of seeing the world so that something, for example, like Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, those, it's not one winning, it's that both, it, it's holding a kind of resolution that allows for different aspects that allows for the material, that allows for the spiritual, that allows for the mm. biological and the artistic and kind of, you know, for me, that's what the great intellectual awakening is. It's, it's creating a space that is less polarized, not just politically, but also in our, our values of, um, yeah, what we value is good thinking mm. in a sense. I mean, it's an interesting question as well, because I have a sense of where I feel the intellectual integration would go mm. um, and also a sense of that actually it, it needs to be more than intellectual integration yeah. it needs to incorporate sort of the more embodied forms of knowing the more yeah. transformational spaces so and i'm 
still not sure whether I'm projecting that onto the IDW conversation, like assuming that they would also share a similar idea, because I don't think they necessarily do. Um, but I see that there's a great quote that begins a book, um, The Epilogue of Passion of the Western Mind by Richard Tarnas, by Robert Bella. And he talks about, um, we may be seeing the, I'll paraphrase, and maybe I can put it up online, um, put it up on, on, on screen, but uh, something like, um, we may be seeing the beginnings of a reintegration of consciousness. It will not be based on any single uni univocal understanding of reality. It will recognize that we have to, to shift between different imaginative vocabularies um, and that we have a propensity to, fit, to slip into one mm. literal interpretation of the world. So we need to be eternally alert to that. Yeah. So it's the sense that Peterson's Jungian map works. Yeah. Um, Brett's evolutionary map works. They map onto each other. They reconcile. Mm. Like lots of different people in the IDW um, have different parts of the puzzle. And I also think there's probably a few other people who are not considered part of the IDW at the moment that probably, if that is the nature of the conversation, will have to come into it at some point yeah. in the future. Yeah. Um, like I, I think, for example, Jamie Wheel, who we did an interview with, mm. who I think is still one of the best interviews we've done, um, is holding such an important piece of what the what the embodied transformational work that we would have to do to be able to yeah w ultimately the, the when we're stuck and not seeing things from another person's mm. perspective or we're not able to understand or there's some kind of block often it's because we're we're holding on to something at a deeper level like a psycho like some yeah. some belief or some um yeah, childhood conditioning or something mm. like that. It's like, and and that ultimately, like, that's the only genuine reconciliation I can see is when we're bringing in the whole person, or we're mm. bringing in, yeah. Um, yeah, we're bringing in sort of the other levels of knowledge as well as just the intellectual. Yeah, um, and also just closing on that point, I'm going to slightly contradict myself from earlier, because yeah, the, I think it's about the re-enchantment of the world, is this a phrase that kind of used sometimes about bringing meaning back into the world. So at the same time as holding a more integral perspective, so it's not necessarily that there's this equivalency of like everything has a piece of the puzzle. It's not necessarily true. I think truth is still the kind of the thing that determines the direction and where all the maps converge. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and yeah, that is it's also, you know, what you were just talking about, being able to hold different perspectives at the same time. That yeah. feels that feels absolutely essential. And for me, it, it's completely wrapped up in creating a more psychologically, psycho-spiritually aware um, society, in a sense, yeah. or, or, you know, intellectual movement, let's say, as well. Cool. Mm. Okay. Um, Ali? I would love, this is, this question is from Adel Sumi, Adel Sasumi. I would like to hear what pieces of art you regard as the highest human achievement that you know of. No, no messing around. In category of raising oneself closer to God and your opinion on music and your perspective on its effects on consciousness, individual and social. So it's a, so how many questions are that? Come it's on. about four. It's a bit cheeky. It's, it's meaty. Um, I'm, I'm going to be a bit cheeky and not answer it with one particular piece of art because I, find, I, t I tried, I kind of sat there and thought um, I'm a lot more, um, I'm not so into visual art. I can really appreciate it, but for me the art that really, um, that I really connect with tends to be literature and music. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to blend a few things together. So pieces of art you regard as the highest human achievement that you know of in the category of raising oneself closer to God. So I think music has that power, maybe mm. more than, and it'll be different for every person, but for me, more than most other art forms. Music has this, especially uh, music sung live or sung all together or played together. So um, I play traditional Irish music, like in pubs, and even that, I wouldn't say that's like a deep mystical experience, but it's really a beautiful flow state. Mm. So in that sense, like music really, um, yeah, it really gets me into a state of flow. And I think most people, especially in a really good concert or gig or whatever it is, that's why, you know, actually Jamie Wheel talks about that in Stealing Fire. It's like, that's one of the reasons we, we love music, you know, it gets us into that, into that space. Um, 
I'm also a big fan of visionary art. So art that's um, created based on the visionary experience, which might be drug induced. It might be, you know, some people do it from lucid dreams. It can be all sorts. Um, I think that's really uh, profound and powerful because it's mm. coming directly from an altered space and it's kind of made with that space in mind. I think art is, like, I've always been really interested in the idea of art as a drug and how can art become, and it is in some way, a drug in and of itself, that it actually puts you in a different state. And I find that concept about art in general, I think any art that manages to do that, and people have that experience looking at Renaissance paintings as well, you know, and so mm. I think that's when it's, that's when it plays that role of getting us, in your words, you know, closer to God or closer to the transcendent or whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, that's my scattered thinking on that uh, very deep question. Mm. What are your thoughts? Um, I'm going to just throw a little curveball in and say that um, what I find myself spending most of my time listening to, and I, 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 I also think music, there's, there's something about music that mm. is, and it also fits with what Peterson talks about, that, our, that meaning is a primary sensation, yeah. Yeah. or meaning is not something that happens secondarily, meaning is something that is very, very prime, primary. Yeah. And music, I think, speaks to that because it, it's, it's able to evoke meaning and able to evoke emotions mm. reliably. And it's like, why does it evoke those emotions? It's, it's, it's somehow tapping quite directly mm. into, um, yeah, in, into our meaning systems. Yeah. Um, so the curveball I was going to throw in is that um, I'm a massive fan of rap. And I love, I love the fact that it is... There's something about the way it just ties everything together. That the perform the thing that they're often mm. rapping about is more and more lyrically dexterous ways of talking about how in the flow in that particular moment they are. <laughs> like it's very self-referential, but yeah. very and very performative. And the best rap, really conscious, really self-aware, really kind of just in that state of flow, I find just really powerful. I love it. Um, mm. And of of the best piece of art that I've been most impressed with, or the pieces of art that I've been most impressed with over the last couple of years, probably Kendrick Lamar's um, Good Kid, Mad City, and then To Pimp a Butterfly. Mm. I wasn't as taken with Dan, although he kind of won a lot more awards for that. But in um, Good Kid, Mad City in particular, there is, it's got a, the depth of a novel. It's got the depth mm. of a, the characterization, the metaphors, the the way that it refers, it's basically about one day and it continually refers back to itself. Mm. It's an absolute masterpiece. Um, and I was obsessed, as you'll probably I agree. Know. <laughs> <laughs> like a couple, a few years ago, I was like yeah. obsessed with Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. I was telling everyone who'd listened, look, this is a masterpiece. This is, this is, yeah. this is, this is a, a, a great novel in musical form. And I feel a little bit vindicated, like people were just saying, Kind of <laughs> and he won a Pul he's now won a Pulitzer for yeah. for the 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 his work and mm. that I'm I, I, yeah I'm glad that he's getting that kind of recognition I'm mm. glad that people are actually realizing that there's a there's an incredible lyrical storyteller there and I don't I don't see many other artists on that level at the moment doing what he's doing um, but yeah I'll I'll, yeah, I won't say that's the, the highest human achievement I know of, but... Um, that's cool. Yeah. Five. Um, Julian Wu says, I'm wondering how you distinguish your and presumably Peterson's position on religion from people like Sam Harris on one hand and people like Paul van der Klee on the other. I assume you'd agree more with Harris than with van der Klee about the ontological status of events like the resurrection. If so, what is the real difference between your positions? Do you see psychological value in religion that Sam Harris does not? Thanks. Also a very good question. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and at this point, I assume you would agree more with Harris than with van der Klee about the ontological status of events like the resurrection. So speaking for me personally, probably yes, I would say to that. If, however, it's a complex question because Something like the resurrection gets into the world of, 
you know, myth and symbolism and what does the re resurrection actually represent mm. psychologically. So, you know, that's kind of where, where my interests lie in terms of religion. Like, the, the word religion is also a tricky one because um, my spiritual practice is usually based around phenomenology. It's actually ex it's experiential. So I'm not, I'm not really big on belief. Mm. I think faith is important, but that's like a whole other topic. There's are some things that are unknowable in a sense. But belief, I've always been skeptical of because um, for me, it's about having a religious experience or say a spiritual experience or a peak mystical experience or whatever it might be. And bringing my own individual sovereignty to integrating it and figuring out, okay, how do I, how me, my ego, how do I integrate this? What do I make of this? Mm. Um, and that's always been my, my way. So I probably have, yeah, I probably do have a, I'm not sure if I'm like Vanderclay or Harris in my perspective on that particular thing. Um, yeah, I'll hand over to you. Mm. Um, I, I feel like I'm only starting now to really grapple with the Christian story in any kind of meaningful way. Like we talked to Paul Vanderclay, I talked with um, Jonathan Pajot mm. the other night, um, and he he had a sort of because because I also heard a few people say. Um, that it all hinges on the resurrection. And I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what that means at the moment, but I've heard more than a few people talk about Christianity in that way, that if the resurrection is not true, then the whole of Christianity falls apart. Mm. Um, I, I don't quite understand all of that yet, but what I, and, and then when I, when I asked that to, to Jonathan, he said something that about that the resurrection is something that happens at the end of time and it happens now and there's some interrelation between um, the resurrection is always with us and is always happening in some sense. Um, mm. I'm paraphrasing probably badly, but I think I, I think I have a felt sense of what he might mean by that. And he was also, uh, like I've, I've, I've been very taken by, by the Jungian explanation or the Jungian examination of, of Jesus as an archetype, as kind of, in a way, it doesn't really matter whether he existed as a person, because what he embodies and represents mm. is the ideal person, the ideal human. And whether that ideal human lived, and whether that ideal human, whether there have been other people who had the same level of spiritual mm. awareness and spiritual presence that he did, there is a sort of moment where that archetype entered the world fully formed. Mm. And it, it means something to all of us and it has ha had a huge impact on the, the direction of Western culture yeah. and the direction of the world. So that idea, at the very least, has a reality, mm. has a really deep resonance and reality. Yeah. Um, the actual state of whether it applies to a, to a person, what that, how that, in a way, I'm, I don't think that's a particularly interesting question. Mm. Because the interesting questions are, what is the nature of this um, archetype? What is the nature of this, um, yeah, this archetype that has that has been so influential? Um, and I think I, I don't yet know enough. I'm looking forward to kind of having more conversations with people mm. who, who maybe have more of a deeper understanding of what it means to them. Yeah. I think the problem with, with religion is when they dispense with that. When it becomes a dogma, or it becomes just a set of a set of. Um, yeah, when the when the dead word stops being infused with the living sort of inquiry, mm. that's where I start to sort of lose patience, and they talk in code, and it's like I don't really understand what that's about. It's nice word, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think. One other thing, one other interesting mm. thing that Jonathan says, we're going to put out Jonathan Pajot's talk. Um, we, we talked for quite a bit longer than the bit we've put out so far. We've just put out the Sam Harris section. So we've got another section talking about the value of organised religion and um, yeah, his, his and my history with Christianity. Yeah. And what I remember from that is his resistance to the Jungian 
analysis because he didn't think the religious should be reduced to the psychological. And, and I, I, I'm again paraphrasing, mm. but that it's it's not a case of explaining it because if it's if it's religiously archetypally true, then the the psychological will be a subset of the the kind of the deeper reality, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, this is a huge topic. I feel like we could talk about a lot. Mm. I mean, I have a few things bubbling away, but I think um, because we have more content coming out on this um, mm. and we'll do another q and I'm going to mm. sit and mull it over because it's so big, actually. Um, maybe move to the next question. Yeah. Uh, which is... Ah, so this is a short one uh, from Peter Geds. I hope I've pronounced that right. Have you read any C.S. Lewis apologetics? If so, what did you think? No, I haven't, and I hated them. <laughs> I also haven't read them, and I also hate them. No, um, we, I, I certainly haven't. I did look it up to see if it would um, be possible to read in time, but it seems like it's quite uh, in-depth and there's a lot to it. So um, thanks for bringing it up. It's really mm. good to be aware of, but um, unfortunately can't, can't add anything to that. Mm. There is, I don't know, obviously, I, I guess most people know C.S. Lewis, the, the author of Lion, Witch and the Wardrobe, which is a deeply kind of allegorical, very Christian yeah. story. Um, I've heard about these before, and I, I, I think, it, yeah, I'd like to check them out as well. Um, all I know about him is that he was part of a very interesting group of, there's, there's a, there was a lot going on in the sort of 30s, 40s, 50s, I think. Yeah. Um, in, I think it was Cambridge. I think it was Cambridge, yeah. There, there was a group called the Inklings. That's right, yeah. Um, was Tolkien, Tolkien was yeah. part of it. C.S. Lewis was part mm. of it. A couple of other people were part of it. Sort of, the very sort of English, um, eccentric, mm. intellectual, um, really trying to understand what the, what the deeper, structure of these kind of mythological stories That's was right. yeah um, that I've always been sort of quite attracted to to learning a bit more about it mm. like them and I think T.S. Eliot as well like a really fascinating character because he was he was an atheist who wrote these amazing poems like the hollow men and then yeah. had a Christian um, then be became a Christian later in life there's, yeah. there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff in in um, those life stories, I think. Yeah, that's an interesting process, Tia, um, Elliot, because modernism was very much a kind of disenchantment of the world. At a, yes, the main poem's called The Wasteland. The Wasteland, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and a you know, response to World War I in many ways as well, around the, 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 the roots of postmodernism come from that, of everything we held sacred and everything that seemed to be safe and secure was kind of blown to shit by World War I, and then the kind of grappling with that Modernist. I studied modernist poetry quite a bit, and it's got kind of a bleak beauty to it. But it, I didn't actually. I kind of forgotten that about Eliot. That mm. then there's this kind of revival of meaning that probably I, I don't know. I imagine was like he would have grasped with both hands, mm. and a lot of people probably would have at that time as well. It's an interesting thing to, to yeah. remember. Yeah. yeah, that it's also interesting that that seems to be the last time, maybe because of the the, the nature of the times. And maybe that's what we're going through again, is, is some sort of sense of, a lot of people have compared this time to a bit like the sort of 1930s and a bit like yeah. the 1960s. Maybe that's when you see these, these spiritual awakenings, these mm. kind of religious awakenings. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> in the answer is no to your question. <laughs> we've managed to, get a, managed to kill five minutes out of it. So, <laughs> um, so what are we, number seven? Number seven. Could you, is it me or you? It's you this time, yeah. yeah. Um, could you do interviews with two people who have different views on the deep issues? I think these make the most interesting interactions. And if you do it, I think conversation is pre preferable to a debate. Watching your content also in Israel. Keep up the good work. Um, Don't forget read. the muscle, the muscle emoticon after yeah, the muscle keep up the good work. Yeah. You do that. Um, yes, mm. definitely. And I think it's a really good shout. Um, sorry we didn't give you your name because it's in Hebrew and we, neither of us can read Hebrew. But... Yeah, doing interviews with two people who have different views and deep issues, like I think it's a great format. Mm. I think, again, that requires this kind of, um, it's part of why the intellectual dark web works. You know, there, there has to be an embodiment on the human level of a certain degree of kind of, I guess what Jordan Greenhall would call 
in our sovereignty to be able to hold um, a space and not get into reactivity. Mm. Um, I think a lot of people can do that. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think it's really, yeah, great. We've been talking a little bit about different ways to do that already. So, yeah. 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 Um, different views on the deep issues. Yeah, I think it's interesting to me to, yeah, I kind of wonder whether, like, so far we've been interviewing the people that we want to interview, that yeah. we're interested in, we like their ideas. I, I'm always interested in who are the people who are pushing the conversations forward. I'm not personally interested in interviewing someone when I know what they're gonna, going to say. Mm. Um, I, I don't find that particularly, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to interview people with differing ideas just for the sake of it. I think it would have to be when both of them had a, had a sense of that there was a genuine inquiry and a genuine sort of possibility for evolution of their ideas. Yeah, definitely. There's something of, of in Zen, there's beginner's mind where mm. you come without any preconceptions and there's a this kind of lack of attachment to your own position. Mm. And that actually is kind of rare sometimes, you know, it, in academia, for example, is very rare. So if you, if you had two academics defending something that they would wrote their thesis on and spent 30 years lecturing and they're both trying to do what they should be doing is finding some kind of truth that allows their ideas to burn away, I think it's very unlikely that that, that's very unlikely when that happens. Yeah, I yeah. So. yeah, and I think the more public profile someone has, the harder it is to yeah. actually be generative. For sure. Um, next question is from G. Thomas. A few episodes back, you guys were talking about some of the negative press surrounding the intellectual dark web, particularly Jordan Peterson. An idea was touched on that I thought you might like to expand on. It seems the fact that Dr. Peterson actually embodies his philosophy uh, to a rare degree is particularly confounding to his detractors. The character attacks, misrepresentation, flat out lies about him and his message. Is this evidence of a disdain for not just the individual, but also for what he represents? I think yes. What do you think? I think yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's a really interesting concept here, which is about congruency and which is about living one's message out in the world. Because I agree, very, very few people actually live out their philosophy in the world. Mm. And to a, to a lesser degree, or a similar degree, their actual, their actual philosophy is, is a representation of their sort of, what's the word? Psychological necessities on one level. Mm. Or, um, like, I think it, he, he talks about Jung and the idea of the conjunction. Yeah. It, um, something conjunction. The sure. conjunction mysterious, mysterium conjunction. Yeah, the mysterium mm. conjunction, I think, mm. where it's about a, a deeper and deeper process of embodiment yeah. of your ideas in terms of your actions yeah. and then a deeper integration of um, different perspectives and finally I think an integration of the masculine and feminine aspects of oneself mm. that, that the, uh, is kind of the, the process of individuation. Yeah. Um, and I do think that that sense of someone who's really living out their ideas in the world and is living from that very deep place of true accountability and, genu and genuine, like I find a, re I find a real, um, yeah, a real integrity, I do think does trigger people who are not living from that place. Yeah. And I think it kind of on some subconscious level calls them out. Yeah. And I think that's, that's part of the reactivity to him is because he's a walking rebuke to people who are not actually living out their philosophies in the world. Yeah. I thought that was, I think that's spot on because there's, especially the, the kind of message of self-responsibility, um, that's what, like he said in, in the recent interview you did uh, last, last week, mm. um, actually I'm not sure we've put this bit out yet, but he does preview, he does mention, you know, especially with, with radical people uh, on the left in, in the example he was using, it's like, have you really taken full ownership of, of yourself and of your own individuality, or are you projecting it outwards? Um, th that was a question yeah. to ask well, them. To yeah. say, 
don't just say yes because it's one yeah. of the hardest things to do so don't assume that you have exactly and that's the point it is constant work like kind of inner growth work uh, mm -hmm. and embodiment work it's constant work i mean it's like everyday mm -hmm. work and it, it's also the sense that postmodernism as a as a like many, many people I, I felt this a long time before i even discovered peterson it's it's you get into an argument with someone who claims there is no truth and it's a performative contradiction because they're arguing from a perspective where there's no truth. It's like, okay, so that's your truth. Yeah. Is that a truth? And also that you cannot, there are certain things about, especially the philosophy of postmodernism, that you cannot live out in the world. Yeah. You, can't, you cannot spend any time at all believing there's no truth. Yeah. And if you, I think this is Jonathan Pajot's um, really clever way of framing it. It's like, well, if, if, if you're a dedicated postmodernist and I come up to you and I say, oh, I've just seen your partner having dinner with someone down the road and they look very intimate, you're not going to say, well, there is no truth. Yeah, that's <laughs> excellent, yeah. You're, yeah. And, and your body is going to tell you certain things. Yeah. And it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've got very, I, I sort of share with Peter a frustration of people who claim to have a philosophy that they're not actually living out in their, in their lives. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a really good point. There's also this, this thing of victimhood culture which is rampant, he, he stands as com completely something that challenges that. Actually, in teaching meditation, I, I, I often say um, that the one thing that drops from your vocabulary when you start meditating is, I couldn't help it. You know, it's this whole thing of like, oh, trigger warning, so triggered, I just can't, you know, that is, that can, that can go with practice and that can go with taking personal responsibility for your own inner world. Um, and that, though, is a hard process. So it's easier to stay in the victim thing, and then to the point you made at the beginning of this question, then you start projecting it out mm. to, to wherever you see it embodied. The thing you don't have or the thing that you're yeah. rejecting is embodied, just start uh, pushing it out. So I think, yeah. So yes, we agree. We agree. <laughs> we also in think short. yes. Um, number nine, mm. a forbidden question that no one can talk about. Oh God, we probably shouldn't to, read it then. We shouldn't read yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Louise brought this up and I think it's a very important question. Where are women's long form deep insights and opinions about the Peterson movement, i.e. Jungian psychology, motivations, <coughs> political issues, men's movement, open dialogue about societal problems, etc., etc. It seems women are not participating in these long form discussions. Um, or am I wrong in an, in an echo chamber? I really want to know the... <coughs> other side of the equation their deep insights from a female perspective likewise yeah. I really want to as well yeah um, we certainly haven't been uh, actually that was a question to you oh yeah no but yeah I'm just gonna repeat that as well no it's a really I also am really curious about this um, and that we have you know some amazing women in our circles who are engaged with these type of ideas very happy to talk about them and I, I wonder if it's a um, question of the, the format of like, you know, most of the stuff is happening on YouTube, people really putting themselves out there, mm. um, whether that's got something to do with it, whether these conversations are happening somewhere else, whether the maybe the conversation around the current form of feminism is so loud that it makes being a woman and saying anything a little bit different, like Louise did uh, in those previous interviews, quite a risky thing to do. Mm. Um, maybe arguably more risky for a woman than a man. I don't know. Yeah. So the next question is from James Carmichael. Um, and James, you've shortened it a little bit. Um, but James tells quite a touching story of um, having been born with uh, visually impaired and then having experiences in school um, where you would... Um, always have support from the teachers, and when you tried to um, talk about that being uncomfortable for you, the way it was given, the kind of, as you put it, you were given a shut up because we know what's best look. Um, and then you go on to talk about um, your father passing away when you were 22, and feeling like your own only real masculine anchor was severed. Um, and you said, during and after his death, my coping mechanism turned into alcohol, smoking, and drugs. I'm 31 now and really trying and uh, putting effort into understanding why I'm like this and what I can do about it. And over the last few years, I've made some great progress due to Jordan Peterson and many other figures like that. 
However, I can't shake this feeling that I've wasted my 20s trying to avoid the pain and anger through booze, etc. And I'm worried that my youth is slowly slipping through my fingers with nothing to show for it. Any advice on what I could do to accelerate the healing process? Books, practical, physical, mental exercises, etc. Thanks, and sorry for the long read. No worries, man. Mm. I think this was the, the question that people voted up the most. Yes. Um, yeah. And yeah, I want to say thank you for sharing that, James. And um, yeah, I think the, the level of personal insight that you're already showing by sharing in that way is showing yeah. that you're, you're on the right track. Because um, there's a lot of people stuck in in pretty crappy situations that can't really articulate it, and yeah. I think at least being able to articulate it is a is is a is a good start. Mm. Um, I yeah, I want to say that like if it's we we can we can give a little bit of advice, but if 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 what you're dealing with at the moment is kind of alcohol and and, and drugs, then um, alcohol and drugs um, therapy, AA, NA. Mm. Um, could be something to look at. Um, grief counselling as well, because yeah. clearly the, um, yeah. you said your father died about nine years ago. Um, I certainly found when my father died, I, you know, I needed to go through some serious, um, yeah, getting it, letting a lot of the emotions out. Mm. Um, for, in terms of like, if, if you're if you're generally pretty stable, then I'd say the thing that has been the most rewarding for me is a men's group um, where we yeah. obviously teach men's work and we're mm -hmm. in a we're in a kind of men's circle together and just to have this space to really speak um, what's real what's true what's authentic with other men I think yeah. is really important and I think men in particular we're now quite aware we we can become very isolated as we get older um, and it's very easy for us to become isolated and also I think to look for support in women and girlfriends that actually we need to be finding outside the relationship to resources for the relationship. Yeah. Um, it's not, not that we shouldn't talk about some things but the balance I think is all wrong if we're looking for all of our sustenance from the intimate yeah. relationship. Yeah, you, you end up making your partner like your mum mm -hmm. in that sense which is not, not the right way to go about it. Um, yeah, so I, I would just um, add to that and like, yeah, thank you for, um, yeah, for communicating that. This is a courageous thing to do. Um, just to echo what David said, yeah, I mean, I think traditional therapies, especially with the right therapist, are very important if it is, some, if it is substance abuse or grief, etc. And then from a kind of place where you feel stable, which you might be already, you know, can't tell just from a comment, um, men's work, I would also put in meditation because mm -hmm. meditation is really um, core practice for connecting to yourself, for knowing yourself. Um, also can be very relaxing if you use it for that too. Um, and yeah, men's circle for sure. Uh, in terms of books, um, ones that were good for me, Warrior, King, Magician, Lover is like one of the original um, it was written in the 70s. It's aged. No, it's, yeah. old. It's, it's more modern than that. It's more modern than the 90s. Is it 90s? Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, it's aged well, even well, even if it's from the 90s. <laughs> that's a good kind of foundational one and quite accessible. Um, and Stoicism, I was yeah. thinking. Yeah, 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 for sure. Marcus Aurelius and yeah. Stoics. Mm. Um, as, as you've already said, that Jordan Peterson's helped. Yeah. Uh, I think the Stoics, have, uh, he's got quite a sort of Stoic take on life. And yeah. Stoics could sure. be good. Um, yeah. Um, do you have any plans to more specifically have integral theory, spiral dynamics, metamodern discussions with any of the guests you have, either prior guests or upcoming ones? Yes, we do. We have actually some, uh, sorry, this is from Calico TMH, is who asked that. We actually have some uh, already recorded integral conversations and are talking about having some more with some pretty significant integral thinkers who are yeah. really mysterious, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm, yeah for pe people who don't know, I think pretty much everyone who's watched our videos so far knows that we've got quite a kind of, yeah. we've got a, res a lot of respect for the integral lens. Yes. Um, yeah. As a kind of developmental model um, of, of consciousness. Mm. And yeah, so we do, We're, th this has always been, this was something that had a huge influence on us reading Trump and the post-truth world after the, mm. the election of Trump. Um, that was Ken Wilber's yeah. ebook, 
and yeah, we we have something coming up next week. It is next week, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had a discussion with Jeff Solzman of the Daily Evolver that um, some time ago now, but we we're going to put it out next week with the series Jordan Peterson and the Left mm. um, as a as a kind of integral take on Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we're definitely going to do more of that. And number 12? Number 12, from uh, Olavi. Mm. I've read some comments about the men's getaway that Rebel Wisdom runs, and they characterize it in Rebel Wisdom as a brand of feminism. Is that a fair thing to say? And how do those counts relate to the current dichotomy of gender politics? Feminism, the third wave, and the second wave, based liberal feminism, and then in brackets, Hoff, Summer, and Paglia, and men's rights activism and Petersonian men's advocacy. And then in brackets, Peterson rejecting feminism and outlining the poor state of masculinity and manhood and a way forward for men. So is Rebel Wisdom a brand of feminism? That's the, that's the key question. There was someone who commented on most of our early videos saying, watch out men, these are crypto radical feminists. Um, <laughs> Fair play to him, he was very persistent. <laughs> he was very persistent, yeah. Um, and it's really interesting, we've actually just come back from America, we've got a whole load of content that we're going to be putting out around masculinity fairly soon. Mm. We spoke to Warren Farrell, who is kind of known as the, the godfather of, the, of the, um, the men's movement, well the men's rights movement, although I think that's slightly unfair because I don't mm. think he, he's synonymous with the men's rights movement. Yeah. Um, He's, he's, a, he's a therapist and a deep thinker and someone who was part of the, the feminist movement itself in the 70s and then um, broke with them over certain ideological difficulties he had with, with, yeah. with feminism as it was developing. Um, but it's interesting, we asked him about this question, he's saying, look, we, a lot, what seems to trigger this guy in particular and some, some other men is any, tell, any talk about men getting in touch with their emotions. Mm triggers them immediately into that's women's talk, that's feminism. It's like, I find it entirely bizarre. I find that whole perspective really bizarre. Yeah. The idea, it just seems incredibly, yeah, it just seems incredibly narrow, the, yeah. the definition of what masculinity is. Um, I, I would not, yeah, I, our work is not only, our work is about emotional, health mm. like saying things that you because that's courage it's also courage, it's courage to be able yeah. to talk about what's really going yeah. on um so i see that as a as a as a masculine trait just as much as it's a, a kind of emotional intelligence feminine trait but also that's not that's not all that our workshops are about as well yeah it's also about a really deep sense of connected to the masculine energy the masculine drive the life force making friends with our anger using that as fuel in our lives mm. integrating yeah. Um, so, I, we're certainly not a, it's a difficult question when someone says, are you a feminist? Because it's usually a barbed, it's usually a hook. Yeah. Because there's no right answer to that and to remain in polite society. Yeah. Because you have to, and I'd give the same answer that Jordan Peterson would give, which is, if you're saying, wouldn't it be great for men and women to be able to offer their skills from, from, from an equal basis? Absolutely. Mm. Um, anything Definitely. less is is crazy. Yeah. If it's the idea that the world is a corrupt patriarchy and men yeah. need to atone for that, and <clears throat> no, that's ideology, and that's not something that I'm yeah. that I'm into. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Likewise, just on that point, I have a very similar <clears throat> feeling around that question. Um, I've never described myself as a feminist, but then again, the, of course, of course, I want equality of opportunity, um, and and. Think it's important to strive for that but as the ideology and as the conspiracy theory no and as the the, the way it's turned into um kind of castration and shaming of the masculine i actually find that like i'm really really not okay with that mm. um and i find that a lot of the men who come to the workshops as well have internalized that to a degree uh to a large degree often all of us have to some extent and part of the work we do is um is going through that and coming out in a kind of grounded, embodied, confident, and relaxed masculinity. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, honestly, that those comments really pissed me off from that guy. And it, it's interesting that it's come up, you mm. know, that someone's read mm. them. 
because uh, yeah, for a similar reason to what you you laid out, it's this. Um, I can understand and would agree with like that the nice guy thing of men being like really overly vulnerable mm. all the time to kind of score points or because that's like oh that that's it's, it's uh, sneaky it's that's sneaky, sneaky. Fuck, it's, it's a, sneaky it's, it's a way to have sex with girls that also probably doesn't I'm sure it works a couple of times for them but like mm. that is really not yeah I'm not about that at all um, but being being in touch with your emotions is absolutely essential and it's what th this kind of reaction against that from from a few people for me that's that's boy a boyish victimhood mm. it's not it's not for me i don't look at that i don't think it's manly i don't know you're any, watching black knight fall <laughs> i don't know any women who would look at that and find that sexy or empowering or strong it would just be like Ugh, there's mm. something unresolved there um yeah yeah and i think we're probably at an hour we forgot to we forgot to set a clock before we started doing this so we're, we're hoping that it's about an hour. It feels like it's about an hour. Feels roughly, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to conclude that by saying we've, we've actually re, renamed our uh, weekend workshops yeah. the New Masculinity. Yeah. So we are, I think what we're offering is, or where we're placing it is within an evolutionary framework of responding to the, to the, the, the rise of feminism, but not from a... And I find yeah. too much of the of the men's rights activist movement is in reactivity to that feminism. Mm. Like it's it's saying, well, look at these angry women in feminism, but it's it's got a real ang it's got a real re reactivity yeah. to it and a real yeah. anger of its yeah. own, and it can easily just become another victim story. Yeah, like women women did this to me. Yeah, rather than an empowering taking responsibility for ourselves yeah. kind of narrative, and so that. That is how we're framing it. We're framing mm. it as, as offering, and I think that has to be in a space of personal growth. That has to be a space of sort of yeah. really embodying our masculinity, because um, because also what we're then fighting against is this kind of gender neutrality of mm. well, there is no such thing as masculinity and femininity. It's all gender neutral, and we sort of plant our flag and say no, that's not true. Yeah, and your deep embodied reality as, as a man. In my experience for myself certainly and mm. for most of the men that we've had in our workshops there is something tangible as a man that we can tap into yeah. that is a is a is something that when we ground ourselves in that we find our relationships with yeah. women improve yeah um, and other men and yeah. with everyone pretty much more present and more authentic which creates trust in men or women as well yeah, yeah. um great and then so there were a lot of amazing questions and we've done 12. I think there were a hundred comments. So, um, yeah, thank you everybody. And on that note, a couple of people asked, um, quite rightly, like whether there can be some kind of chat, uh, or some way for us to continue this conversation all together in some forum. And there is now, because we have created a discord and in the show mm -hmm. notes for this, um, will be the link. So, uh, click it if you want to join. Um, our, our hope is to create quite a thriving community where we can bounce ideas back and forth, where we can, um, yeah, explore the content we're putting up, suggest new content, just debate, get to know one another. Um, yeah, and I'm personally really looking forward to that. It should be cool, and I, I hope you'll join us. Great. Thank you.